So I'm going to get started in a minute because it's 9.48, 9.49 according to my watch. I don't want to start too early and disappoint the people who come in late. Okay, so I might as well get started. Hello everybody, my name is Dave Neary. I work for Red Hat in the open source and standards team. What we do is we make all of the open source projects, or try and make all of the open source projects that, that uh, Red Hat is invested in uh, wildly successful, whatever that means for that project in specific. So one of the tools that we use is personas, and I'm gonna guide you a little bit through today. Um, what are personas, how you can use them, uh, how they're useful in terms of uh, thinking about your product discussions and your marketing discussions around a project. And um, specifically thinking about, about OpenStack and how, how, we can, how we can use maybe personas to, 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 help, uh, to help facilitate discussions in the OpenStack project. Okay, so I should start with a problem statement. What are personas? Why do we have them? And what, what problem are they solving? So one of the things that you'll hear a lot in, in open source projects in general and even outside of open source is uh, you'll hear people talk in generalities, just like I am now, uh, about uh, what their users want. Um, one of the discussions I've had recently with a colleague is we were doing a, a website and he said, what do you mean? You've got an open source project and you don't have a, a download the source link on the front page? You don't have a link to the license? And I said, well, you know, thinking about our target audience, we're thinking about people who want to install this first, and then maybe later they'll start getting involved. And we don't want to scare off people who aren't familiar with, you know, downloading source code and compiling projects. Um, we don't want to scare them off by having that be one of the primary artifacts that they see. And so we ended up in this discussion, you know, open source projects, we must have a download source code link. And I said, well, you know, that doesn't fit into what the primary target audience of the website is. So when you get into these con kinds of conversations, what, typically what you'll find, the symptom uh, is the conversation. The actual core problem is that you don't have a key understanding of a common frame of reference in that conversation for what your user is, who you're talking about. So, you know, when you're talking about, no one uses fe feature X. I've, I've, I've seen in the GNOME project, which is another project I've been a long time contributor to, the number of times where uh, every now and again, somebody will say, well, why are we even supporting 1024 by 768? Nobody uses that anymore. Except we have some statistics for the screen sizes that people use in GNOME, and about 20% of our user audience is 1024 by 768. So um, uh, it's a question of not being, being distanced from your audience and, uh, and thinking that everybody you know who uses the software is, is representative of the, of, the, of the general target audience for the software. So personas can help there. Um, specifically in the OpenStack project, uh, this is, this is uh, an extract from uh, the OpenStack User Committee Charter. Uh, an OpenStack user may have different roles, it can be a consumer, an operator, an ecosystem partner, a distrib distributor provider or appliance vendor of OpenStack. Uh, a user, an OpenStack user may be from different types of organizational affiliation, um, uh, company, government, nonprofit. Uh, can come from different market segments, so they talk about healthcare, uh, military, uh, state, and, and, and government, or, or uh, uh, there, there are a list of about five or six different market segments. And then finally, geographic regions, you know, Asia Pacific, uh, India, Europe, South America, and North America. And the thing is that this is really broad. I have absolutely no understanding of what an IT manager of a military um, organization in Indonesia has as his constraints when he's deciding what cloud software to use, right? If that's part of our target audience, and clearly it is, then we need to understand that person, what his problems are, what his needs are, and how we can solve them. And so that's where personas come in. And it's kind of a bad word in open source projects, marketing, right? This is where the personas have come from, but they've been used in the marketing world and the communication world for decades. So I want to talk a little bit because this is a bad word. What is marketing? Why is it appropriate here? We think of it as, as kind of uh, putting lipstick on a pig, right? 
you take whatever the, whatever the developers give you, and the marketing is, OK, how can we sell this now? How can we push this down people's throats? Right? And that's the idea we have of marketing in the technical world in general. Um, and that's not what I think of as marketing. Uh, so I'm going to guide you through what I think of as marketing, and, and, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll all realize that you're all in the marketing department, uh, including the people who aren't in this room, actually, who uh, may need that. So the first thing, the very first thing in, in marketing is you, you need to know your target audience. You need to understand who am I aiming for with this product or project? Uh, what am I trying to achieve? What is the problem that I'm trying to solve? So once you know your target audience, you can identify the problems that they have, and then from there, try and fix them. Right, so you've got an idea of who your target audience is, who, which market segment you're going for, and then you've got an idea of a problem that they have. This is um, from FOSTEM this year. The, the projector was, we had to get a replacement projector and the projector was pointing too low. The problem was that the projector was pointing too low. The solution was to put a bottle underneath it. Um, you know, it's a hack, but it solved a problem, right? Uh, so if you can fix a problem that people have, then you're in good shape. And then once you know that somebody has a problem and you fix the problem, that's not enough. You then need to let them know that you have a solution to their problem. You need to get the word out. And uh, that's where the communication and marketing that we typically think of, you know, Marcoms, comes into play. It's uh, now that we have something that we feel like people will want to hear about, how do we actually reach them and get to them with that message? And in the old world of, of uh, broadcast communications, and I say old, it's only been for the last 60 years since we've had television and radio, um, and it's in the process of dying, so maybe Broadcast communication was a, was a blip in the history of, of marketing. I don't know. We're not going to go into that today. Um, in the old world of broadcast, the, the way you got your message out was you know, by spending as much as you could in, in, in as broad a channel as you could. You kind of plastered everybody with the same message, and you hoped that the, the subsection of that audience that was interested in your message would, would hear it and see it. Um, in the open source world, that's not quite what we do. Um, it's important in the open source world, uh, and in general, in fact, to go where your target users are. You need to be sure that, for example, one of the, one of the, one of the things that, that you see in, uh, in open source projects in general is, is that we go to open source conferences to promote our stuff, right? FOSTEM, OSCON, uh, the Linux Foundation events, right? The, these are the places where you go to hear about open source projects. Uh, but if you're doing something like OpenMRS, which is medical record systems, maybe you want to go to medical conferences, places where doctors are and people who are deciding on the IT infrastructure for hospitals because that's your target audience. Those are the people who are going to adopt your software. The fact that it's open source is kind of a nice secondary selling point, but the primary selling point is we do electronic medical, medical record systems. So you need to go to where your audience are, and that's a key mistake that a lot of people do in open source projects in general, and again, personas can help with that. Uh, it's not enough that you know who your target audience is, that you know what problems they have, that you've solved those problems, and that they've heard about your solutions to those problems. When they use it, they then have to actually like your solution. right? They have to adopt it, and it has to be easy for them to use. If, they, if you make it hard for somebody to adopt your software, then it's never going to take off no matter what you do. Um, one CEO that, I've, uh, that I know has a, has a test that he does. He sets aside an hour a week. He asks people to, to propose four projects that he will test in that hour. He gives them 15 minutes each. If in 15 minutes he cannot install the software, configure it, and have something useful happen with it, he's not going to look at it. Right? That, that will never get into that company. It's got to be that easy to use. So that's the test that you've got to apply to your own stuff is, can somebody from our target audience take this up and do something use, useful with it almost immediately? And if you're not there, then you're not going to get take up whether, whether you like it or not. And finally, something which is new in the open source world, which is not so uh, relevant perhaps in the commercial software world, is that uh, if you want to get people to go from using your software to being contributors and engaged users of your, of your product and kind of going further down the funnel, you've got to be nice. You've got to have a nice culture. It's very important in open source projects to think of the culture that you have and how welcoming people's first experience is with your, with your community. And so that's marketing in the open source world. Uh, it's kind of the four P's if people here have done business studies. It's the, the, I mean, it's the standard uh, price, position, 
uh, product and placement, what is it? Yeah, very good. So, and there are several other Ps that people occasionally throw in uh, to complement the four Ps. But um, this is marketing 101. It's you have to have a good product uh, that people know about, that people like, and that's got the right price. And in price, price in the open source world is typically the amount of time you've got to invest in it. Okay? Right, so how does that relate to persona, personas? And um, this is the only slide where you will see the two. I know that there are two plurals for persona. I acknowledge that the Greek origin of the word would mean that it's pluralized to personae. For the context of this presentation, I'll use personas. Okay. Uh, this is the book the, that introduced personas to the world of uh, information technology. Uh, the Inmates Are Running the Asylum. This was a book uh, which basically the, the, the starting premise of the book is we have engineers writing software for people who are not engineers and they don't know how to do it. They're writing software for themselves. They're writing software which reflects the architecture of the, the software they're writing rather than reflecting the conceptual model that people using the software have. Uh, so anybody here who's into user experience design um, will has the, the, um, um, uh, the Don Norman books, Emotional Design, uh, The Design of Everyday, Everyday Things. Um, very similar idea is, is there was a break, there was a disconnect in IT in the 1980s and 1990s between what we were producing in the IT industry and the way people perceived how that software should work. So you ended up with horrible software with lots of options and, uh, and so on. So he introduced the idea of personas in terms of uh, product development, in terms of uh, coming up with user interface design. Um, and this, as I said, it's been used in many other industries for, for, for decades. Um, so what is a persona? So the, the basic elements of a persona is if you want to, uh, to get down to the, to the nub of the matter, you want a persona to be real enough that you can identify with the person, but abstract enough that it represents a group or a market segment rather than just one individual. Um, so a persona um, typically has a name. Will typically, uh, you'll typically associate a photo, like any face at all will do. Age, family, job situation, anything which is relevant to your target audience. So if you're targeting something which people use in your spare time, maybe you're going to focus more on this, the, the outside of work life aspect of the persona. If it's something that people use professionally, maybe the fact that you just want to acknowledge the fact that they do have a life outside work and that IT is not their primary passion, right? Unless your target audience is people whose primary passion is, is IT and then you maybe you want to focus on the fact that they spend three hours a night recompiling kernels. It's not the 1990s anymore. We don't do that anymore. Um, so it's distilled characteristics of, of a, a, a market segment. Um, a useful tool that I've found in thinking of coming up with personas, you won't have one typically for a project, you'll have several, uh, is to think of the, in terms of the community types. This is a, a, the four communities is, is something that Simon Phipps has used in a, in, a, in a couple of blog posts. So you can have, typically you can have user communities or developer communities in open source projects. And in the user communities, you have individuals who want to use your software. Those are kind of engaged users, people who are kind of joining forums, uh, posting to mailing lists, who want to update uh, documents in a wiki, uh, they want good documentation, and they want community engagement, the ability to exchange with other users. You've got deployer communities, people who are taking that software, packaging it up, perhaps including some extras, and shipping that to um, to people directly. So they have different needs. They want a, a, a kind of a higher quality communication channel with the core developers because they're representing much more than just one person. Uh, you can have the core developer communities. Um, so you've got either the people we typically think of as the open source developers, the people who are working on the core code. Uh, so they need patch review, course source control, mailing lists, they hate forums, hate forums. Um, and all of the other kind of uh, developer tools that we, we were used to in open source projects. And then you've got the, the extension developer, they have different needs, right? Something like uh, what you see in Firefox extensions, the, the store, right? They want a path to market. They want good API documentation. They want good developer tools. 
So by thinking of the, in terms of the community types and where do these people fall, the, the target audience archetypes, where do they fall, will help you also kind of find the solution to the problem. So here's an example of a persona. It says, don't worry about the text on the right. This is just a screenshot. Um, I've summarized the, the main point, points on the, on the, the, the left, right. Left, right. Um, so this is Frank. He's 32 years old. He's a system administrator in a medium-sized company. Um, he's the guy who the CIO will go to to figure out what technologies to, to test in the lab so that they can decide what they're going to, going to deploy at the next, next release cycle. Right? Um, so he's kind of interested in technology. He's kind of the free software guy in the company. Everybody knows this person. Right? He's kind of the free software guy, but he's typically a user, uh, somebody who keeps track of the latest tech trends, but you know, basically by Hacker News and, and, and Reddit and, and whatever, whatever kind of the standard mainstream tech channels are. He's not going to be on developer mailing lists. He's not going to have the time to do that because he's got his job to do. Uh, outside of work, he's, he's a tech enthusiast, but He's kind of a hobbyist programmer, but he doesn't spend his weekends doing this stuff, right? It's essentially a job for him. So how do we get to Frank? Does Frank go to conferences? Is Frank here this week? I would say no. Uh, JBoss example. This is a, a, a developer. So this is uh, one that uh, the JBoss community... Previous one, Frank. That was me. That was kind of a, an amateur thrown together. Uh, over the course of a few weeks in a few hours. And we'll see how to do that later. Um, JBoss, this is a professionally developed uh, persona. So much more work up front, uh, much more professional. And you can see there's much more information in there as well. Uh, so this is Matthias. Matthias is a, a kind of a senior developer building in-house applications in a largish company. Uh, he's a bit of a laggard technology-wise. He has enough on his plate just to, with the work he has to do um, he doesn't want to spend all of his day looking at what's the, what's the, the newest snowflake on the market. Um, he's not going to test the next CMS. He's not going to test the next uh, MVC framework. He just wants to use what he knows, what he knows will work. Um, Matthias is not going to be the person who's going to get JBoss into the company. right? How do we reach Matthias? How do we have, uh, influence his decisions and make sure that we're getting our stuff into, 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 the, uh, into the framework? So this is a persona. This is why it's useful. And we'll see later. Uh, OpenStack personas. Some of the personas that we might have in the OpenStack project in terms of operators, we talked about um, uh, maybe the, the typical use case for, a, for an OpenStack user would be somebody who's running a QE lab. Right? We've got the guy who's uh, operating the lab so that we have QE engineers who can spin up their own VMs, test something, test an application in an environment, and kind of tear it down very quickly, right? Make, make that workflow easy. Um, perhaps we're talking about system administrators serving internal customers, right? So we've got people who want to uh, be able to reboot their own internal services, uh, kind of a private cloud, right? Uh, or maybe we're going to be focusing on something like uh, an ISP, right? Somebody who wants to... Uh, make a, make a, just give a, make a VM available to uh, customers, build them according to what they use, um, make it highly available. Those are the kind of the features that they're interested in. In terms of resellers, distributors, uh, maybe we're talking about somebody who's building a public cloud offering, somebody like Rackspace or HP. Uh, maybe we're talking about somebody that's uh, like Red Hat doing, a, doing an OpenStack distribution. Uh, or maybe we're talking about uh, companies that are selling uh, add-on, value-add, uh, products on top of OpenStack. Each of these are different types of people, and they each have different needs. Um, in terms of end users, these are just ideas for potential, pot potential personas for, for the OpenStack project. Uh, if you're talking about a DevOps that wants to man maintain many services, so he wants kind of monitoring over a series of, 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 uh, of VMs, uh, perhaps somebody who just wants to run a web service and wants to make it highly available, so we need to have load balancing, we need to have kind of redundant services and and backups and snapshots and all of that kind of stuff is more important. Um, and so on. OK, so that's what personas are. That's what they look like. Uh, what use are they? Uh, so uh, we've already seen it quite a lot. I'm not going to labor this point. But essentially, they're useful in terms of user interface decisions, because by having an idea of the person that you're targeting, you have an idea of their technical level. You have an idea of what. Uh, pre, what uh, kind of prior knowledge they're bringing into the experience. 
um, for something like educational software where you have different user, user audiences that are all going to be using the software. So you're going to have kids of different ages, right? Preschool kids, you're going to present a different user interface than you are to uh, high school kids, for example. Uh, teachers will want a way to, to, to interact with the system as well. Khan Academy has three separate interfaces. They have one for the students, one for the teachers, and one for the parents who want to track how their kids are doing and figure out where, the, where, there's, where there's difficulties. The, the classic example in the, the inmates are running the asylum is um, people using an in-flight entertainment system in airplanes. Right? The needs of the first-class passenger who is traveling every week and is not going to be happy if there are only three films because he's seen them already twice this month are not the same needs as the mother of three who's traveling with her kids and wants to make sure that they're not going to be watching the violent movies that she doesn't want them to be watching. Right, so you need to have the different interface. And that's not going to be the same interface that the flight attendant is going to use to reboot a seat if it's having problems. Or that the techni technician is going to use in the airport to upload new, new movies. Or that the airport executive is going to use to, uh, to evaluate where the movies are going to go and how they get classified and, and, and what the deals are with the, with the studios and whatnot. So uh, do I need different user interfaces and what are those different user interfaces going to present to people depending on the, the, the user profile that they have? How can I reach my target audience? Uh, so we saw it with Frank. Frank's not going to be here this week. How do we get to Frank? Okay, so maybe kind of standard communication, press releases, uh, analyst relations, all of that will reach Frank because they'll get picked up by mainstream news sites and, and somebody will will blog about something cool and, and, uh, that we're doing, and, and, and Frank will pick that up through Reddit. Okay, maybe. Maybe we need something else to reach Frank. Maybe we need a roadshow, right? So maybe Frank won't come here, but maybe if there's an OpenStack meetup in his town, he'll go there. So how do we go about spreading out these, uh, the, the, this kind of outreach to the, to the, to the, to the tips? Um, another place where it comes in useful is thinking about feature decisions, right? Do I need, which, between, uh, I'm going to try and think of an OpenStack example, between, okay, let's forget the OpenStack example, uh, between, um, between feature A and feature B. <laughs> uh, feature A is going to be more useful to one target audience segment, feature B is going to be more useful to others. Uh, which one do we prioritize? Where do we put our investment first? Right? And personas can help you frame that kind of decision. And finally, what should our website look like, right? So it's one thing to think about website as a promotional tool. Another use of the website is, is an informational tool for people who are using your software. Uh, so you can think of, okay, what are the kinds of questions that people have when they come to my website? How can I answer those questions quickly? Is it more to find out about the project or more because they're having problems and they need to, need to find kind of troubleshooting? Or is it because they want to get in contact with the developers? Or is it because they want to meet other users? Or is it because they would want to download the software? Or is it because they want to uh, compile from source? Right, so in terms of thinking of your target audience and thinking of the kinds of things that they want to do, that can help you very, very much in coming up with better websites. To, re to summarize all of that, what personas do is they allow you to focus discussion on a specific frame rather than have this broad discussion where you're talking about your users, your developers, um, and so on. Okay, so how do you come up with one? We've seen, uh, I think, that they can be useful. We've seen what they look like. How do you come up with one in an open source project? What, what's the process? Because right, one of the things that, uh, that's uh, difficult is that you can invent personas, but you don't know whether they're right or not. So the first step in coming up with personas, typically, is to do interviews. You talk to people who are potential users of your software, current users of the software, users of your competitor's software. Uh, and by talking to these people, you, you don't want, to, one of, the, trip, uh, one of the, um, the traps that you can fall into is to talk about your personas as people who are already using your software or people who are um, to kind of idealize and say, this person has the problem that the software solves, right? Without actually having a clear idea of what problems people actually have. So to, to think in terms of idealized terms rather than the concrete. So for Overt, for example, I talked on the, on, on the user's mailing list to maybe a dozen or two dozen um, users of, of Overt software to find out what type of company do you work for? Uh, how are you using this software? What was attractive about this software? Uh, do you use anything else? Um, any information that you can get which will help you understand 
the problems that these people are having and how you can eventually solve those problems and solve them better. Once you've got a set of interviews and you can have, in professionally done ones, you can have hundreds. Right? I've, I, I, I talked to a colleague last week who was telling me, yeah, when, we, when I do an interview, I do about 100. Um, uh, when I do a persona, I do about 100 interviews, and then I condense those down. So you cluster and consolidate, consolidate your profiles into archetypes. You want to reduce those 100 down to a small, manageable number. Right? So you say, uh, OK, uh, I did an interview with this person and this person. They're essentially the same use case. I can merge those. I did an interview with somebody who is uh, managing a small cloud for um, a communication company, right? internal managing infrastructure and managing storage. And I did the same thing, and it was somebody in a different market segment, but essentially the same problem set. So if I solve the problems for him, I'm going to solve the problems for her too. So you can merge those. And by, by that, you can get it down to a manageable number. I would say for most projects, between four and eight is probably a good number of personas. So once you've clustered things down to about four to eight kind of market profiles, you've got four to eight piles of interviews, then you're in good shape. Now what you want to do is distill from those piles of interviews, the salient details. What represents that pile uh, in, each, uh, in each persona? So you're kind of bringing it down to the, the, the core details of what you're interested in in the, pers in, the, in, the, in the person, in the archetype. And so your end result, uh, when you've done all that, you've, you've got your, your, your persona, which has the picture, the name, and so on. The end result of that is that you have easier discussions, right? All of your internal discussions become easier because you're, you're no longer talking about your users. You're talking about Ellen. You're talking about Brian. You're talking about James. You're talking about Ahmed. Uh, you're talking about uh, specific people that represent groups of, of your target users. So you can say, well, OK, adding that feature will help Ellen, but actually it makes things more difficult for Brian. How do we do this in a way that keeps both satisfied? Right? Uh, so it makes it easier to have those kinds of discussions internally. Gives you a better idea of the publications that you target because you know what, what people are reading, or you have some idea because you've been asking those questions during the interviews. Uh, you know what websites people read. Um, gives you a better idea of the conference plan to go to, so you're focusing your investment on conferences where your target audience are actually going to be there, rather than going to conferences and kind of uh, talking in the echo chamber, which we can sometimes feel like we're doing, in, 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 especially in open source projects, where you go along and you, you see the same people every two months. I say, well, are we meeting anybody new at these conferences? Are we getting value for our money here? Um, it gives you a better idea of what your users want because you're putting yourself in their shoes. It's, it's, it's a very good tool for creating empathy with your users and your, your, your target users. And the end result of it, which is what we all want, is more and happier users. Right? We've got, at the end of this, you're going to see your user base grow because you're going to have a product that's going to address their needs better than it did before. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments or feedback? Or do you all want to go to your next session? OK. So the question was, are there any examples of open source projects that have gone through this process in the community? Um, I mentioned Overt earlier. Uh, I, I, I do know of several projects that have done personas in the past, but I don't know if they've been kept up. I know that they've been done in the Aeolus project, for example, which is uh, uh, the upstream project for, for cloud forms. I don't want to just talk about Red Hat projects. Those are the ones I know best. Um, we've done some in the GNOME project in the past. Uh, around GNOME 2 time. Um, most of them have been done at the, at the impetus of companies that were participating in these projects. Uh, I don't know of any others. Does anybody know of any other projects that have been doing personas successfully? <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, other open source software projects. I'll repeat what you say, that's fine.
This is skater, you said? Skater. Skater. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Was that was that your your reply to Farik or or was that uh, your question or your comment? Okay. Right. So your question was your 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 comment was that Scalar, I'm repeating for the cameras. <laughs> Uh, Scalar uses three types of personas uh, to, to kind of focus their discussions. One is, is the uh, software developer that doesn't have any operations experience, who's more interested in self-service and having assumptions made for him. The system administrator going into DevOps, so this is the person who's going to operate the cloud. And then the IT director who's going to be choosing the, the, the cloud software that the company deploys. And they're more interested in collaborative, how, how, do, how is this going to fit into our, our IT infrastructure and how does this work with other pieces that we're already using? Is that a fair summary? Okay. Cool. Right, so question. Ask your question. Um, what? what OpenStack personas are underrepresented in the user community? Uh, well, right now we don't have any personas. Uh, so what we have in the user committee is a pretty broad idea of what our target user audience is. And my suggestion is that we actually go about creating some personas over the next few months, which help us to focus those, those, those discussions. So I would say all of them is the kind of the glib answer to your question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I have, I'd honestly, in terms of the, the, so you're asking it in terms of the, um, the people on the user com committee, they represent a kind of a broad basis yeah. of people and their map, and again, repeating for the camera. <laughs> um, so in, in terms of the, the people on the user committee, which people are missing that would be in the target audience? Is that, was, that, was that your question? So certainly I think in terms of uh, some of the user segments, the education user segment, it seems to be pretty well, education research, research lab seems to be pretty well represented. Um, uh, certainly private enterprise, you know, bigger companies doing, doing public cloud and, and large private cloud, they seem to be well represented. Uh, I would think uh, in terms of um, Asia PAC, uh, Japan, Singapore, uh, China, underrepresented. But I haven't been following perhaps as closely as I should have, but certainly, uh, and kind of people who want to use this, I don't know if that's even a target audience. Right, if, but if we're imagining people would be using this for their personal virtualization needs or small to medium sized business, so you're talking about somebody who's got maybe three to 10 servers um, using this for a small private cloud, I don't know if we have any of those represented on the user committee right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the practical tools, uh, what are the practical tools that people can use for this? I love paper. I, really, paper and pens, great. Right? You can draw stuff. Uh, wikis are good. Uh, anything that, that allows you to throw stuff up quickly, uh, wikis are good. But I, I start with paper and pen. Uh, email for interviews. And it's, it, this is low-tech stuff. You don't, they, 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 typically, what's missing in, in persona development is not the... Um, is not the tools to do it, it's the kind of the time and the, volu the, the volonté, to use the French word, the, the will to, to carry it through. Yeah. So this is, in, this is a presentation of personas as a general idea, not a proposal to do this in the context of the user committee, but I would like to kick that off and it would be, the natural place would be the user committee mailing list, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.
Thank you. Okay, shall we call it a day? Thank you very much. I hope it was uh, useful to you. And you have four minutes to get to your next presentation.